Hi. I'm going to stand here if that's okay so I can show things on the screen. Can you all see me? Awesome. So, Tina Koto Katoa, I'm Catherine Thais. I work at the University of Canterbury in the um, School of Psychology, Speech and Hearing. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight because I'm here to talk about an area that I'm very passionate about, and that is communication disorders. So, effective communication is incredibly important because we use it every day um, to just stay connected with other people around us. But unfortunately, talking and listening um, does not come easy for everyone, and some people have problems with communication. And so we know that that is far-reaching consequences, because if you have problems with communication, your social networks will diminish. Um, you may start presenting with depressive symptoms, um, and so overall, you will feel a lot more unhappy. So in addition to problems with mental health, we know that people with communication disorders can um, also have more physical problems. So uh, it can also affect physical health because if you don't know how to communicate well um, or you have some struggles to explain to people how you are feeling, what is going on, you may not immediately get the right treatment. And so we know that people with communication disorders can see some negative consequences um, of um, different treatments, not receiving them on time. So we see more hospitalizations and it can even lead to increased mortality over time. So because of that, we are doing lots of studies uh, to try and improve diagnosis, but also treatment of communication disorders. And one area that I will focus on uh, tonight is stuttering. So most of you will know about developmental stuttering. So that is what occurs um, mostly in preschoolers uh, when they start to repeat words over and over again, and they can repeat sounds, and sometimes they, their mouth can seem stuck when they are trying to say things. We know that in children with developmental stuttering, there is a neural basis to their problems. So we know that there are differences in the way that their brain works when we uh, compare with children who do not stutter. However, we don't know what the exact cause of the stuttering is yet. In addition to developmental stuttering, though, we also have something that we call acquired neurogenic stuttering. So this is when people have spoken fluently their whole lives, and then at one point they can have a stroke, for example, or traumatic brain injury, or they can have Parkinson's disease. And because of that, they can start to stutter. So acquired neurogenic stuttering, unfortunately has not received a lot of attention in the past and because of that we don't have good criteria for diagnosis and we don't have any evidence-based treatments. So that's an area that we are addressing at the moment. So in the lab we are running a couple of different studies um, to really try and use a comprehensive approach. So to combine information around speech characteristics, um, but also results of brain imaging scans and combine those with treatment outcomes in both people with developmental stuttering and acquired stuttering. So to answer some of our questions. So one approach that we use is uh, we look at brain lesions of people who have had strokes or traumatic brain injuries, for example. So you've seen a couple of these scans before. Um, so in the image on the left here, you see a brain of uh, one of the people that we have worked with. Uh, so this person had a stroke and started to stutter following the stroke. So what we did is we created lesion maps. So we created maps of the lesion uh, that they had to look where that lesion occurred and to see how it was associated with stuttering. So if we create lesion maps of lots of different people, we can then do group comparisons. So we can do statistical analyses. And that can lead to images like the one that you see here, which is the result of what we call lesion symptom mapping. So the um, areas that you see here in the bright red, so those are areas that are significantly more associated with an onset of stuttering following stroke. And so these areas um, overlap with all of the colored areas that are underneath. I don't know if you can see those, but those colored areas underneath represent our minimal network for speech production. So they're brain areas that are really crucial to help us to produce speech. So and unsurprisingly, if people start to stutter, we see that they have lesions in those core speech networks. So what we have done now is we have taken this one step further uh, because as Tracy has mentioned, 
our brain um, with networks in the brain. So we have different uh, areas of the brain that are connected to each other and that communicate with each other to support different functions. So um, what is shown here is the result of lesion network mapping. So rather than looking at exactly where a lesion occurs, we are now looking at networks of brain regions. And so all of these red areas here are lesions following stroke in people who started to stutter following their stroke. And then for each of those patients, we have created a map of all of the functional networks that are affected by that lesion. And so we have done that for every person separately, and then we look at the overlap in all of those networks. And so this gives us a little bit more information. Um, so in this case, we see that the areas are more restricted to motor control circuits, and we also see a bilateral representation. And so at the moment, we are linking these imaging findings with the imaging findings that we have uh, in people with a developmental onset of stuttering as well. So we are also linking our imaging findings with what we do in treatment and um, the treatment techniques that we use and how they are associated with different outcomes. So I think the best way to give you some more information about treatment is by showing you a couple of short video clips uh, rather than me explaining what we do. Um, so I think the videos are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so this is one of the um, people with neurogenic stuttering following stroke that I've worked with. And we're really fortunate to actually have a video of her that was taken one month before she had her stroke. So um, I'm gonna play a short clip so that you uh, can get an idea of what her speech sounded like. And we've got quite a few colors, mostly natural colors, black, navy, green, lots of cream. And like we've got 19 micron for people that know the wool. Uh, we've got 125 micron and we've got merino and silk. And okay, so I think that you've all noticed that her speech is really fluent. So she's a confident woman. So um, she's a salesperson who enjoys talking to customers and selling the wool. So um, this is a video of her following the stroke just before we started the treatment. About yourself and about what happened to you with the stroke. It was my stri stroke, stroke. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> the the, the, the f f first thing, uh, I, I was sitting uh, on my chair at the, uh, uh, where I have my... So... I think that you'll notice the difference in speech. So she repeated a lot of words, but she also repeated a lot of sounds uh, as well. And so she definitely stuttered um, quite clearly uh, throughout the collection of the speech samples. And the problem for her was not really that she stuttered, but that she felt really frustrated um, because of the speech problems. And she started to completely withdraw from social contact. So uh, she didn't want to participate in any social activities, but she also started to even withdraw from having contact with her family as well. Um, so a very different person compared to um, the first video. And then the next video is um, one of the videos that was taken during one of our treatment sessions. Oh. <laughs> I talked to my friend at this, then we had a cup of tea. Great. So we were practicing a technique that she could use to speak fluently. She did it really well. After that, we worked on removing um, the support systems and she um, yeah, made amazing progress. But even more important than the changes in her speech were just the changes overall. Like just because she felt that she could communicate again. She started to become a lot more active. She um, just was in touch with her children and grandchildren a lot more and started to participate in a lot of activities that were being organized. So to the point even that when she came to our treatment sessions that she often said that she was really tired because she had such a busy social schedule. Uh, so I just want to highlight that just by giving people a little bit support of support and by teaching them techniques to regain communication function, we can really, really make a big difference in people's lives. So um, 
I think my key message today is communication is really, really important. So if you notice that people start having difficulties communicating, if you notice that more and more breakdowns in communication are occurring, don't just yeah, accept it, but ask for referrals, go and seek help because help is available and it can really help.